Hello, this is Gail Sato on behalf of Think Magazine. Today we're chatting with customer experience expert Jean Bliss, who has fired up the customer service culture at five major corporations, including Land's End and Coldwell Banker. Jean, thanks for talking with us today. Oh, you we are so welcome. It's great to be with you, Gail. Well, we're so looking forward to, to our conversation because customer service is a topic that's near and dear to the hearts of credit unions. Um, and I think most credit unions really pride themselves on their member service. Mm-hmm. However, after um, reading up on some of your ideas about providing great service, I think that um, your notions may go beyond what most of us think of as normal good <laughs> service. Um, what really, What do you think really makes the difference between offering good service and really inspiring love in your cu- customers? Well, you know, I love that I love that question and here's what we know is happening in the marketplace today, which is that customers are talking to each other, to their friends, to their relatives, to their colleagues and to free, complete strangers more than they're heeding the marketing materials and the advertisements of companies telling them how great they are. And so the thing that we we know earns the rave, earns the right for a company to call themselves a beloved company is delivering an experience. So I want you to hang on to that word experience with me uh, throughout our call. Delivering an experience that's deliberate, that identifies the moments where the, the company intersects the customer's life and where they know they have an opportunity to improve their life and that they deliver those moments of connection with reliability, but by creating a human connection that they can't find anywhere else. And that combination of reliability and moments fused um, that deliver an experience the customer wants to repeat again equals love. Wow. Now that that may sound simple enough when we're <laughs> we're just chatting on the phone, but that's a that's a difficult thing to accomplish, isn't it? It, it is. Well, it is and it isn't. It depends on – so what we know about this work is that, you know, we, we call customer service frequently the customer service department. And we when things go wrong, we say, why isn't customer service doing a better job? Or why isn't our customer service better? Um, but what this work is that we, we're starting to use the word customer experience around is around really thinking about how your customer traverses their life and where you intersect their life. So being deliberate about the stages, they may have a life event that changes that they they want to make a move or they need they may be researching what a credit union means in their life. How are you deliberate in helping them with answers? When they contact you the, for the first time, do you make it a memor- a memorable experience? Um when you have to deliver bad news whatever that is, do you do it with humanity? When you hire people, Do you hire people that have skills and core competencies around nurturing relationships, or are you putting the proverbial butts in seats, if you can excuse my French? Yes. And and so that's really what it's about, is about being deliberate and about being proactive in thinking about what you're going to deliver. To me, that that recalls um, the the term that I saw you use a few times, which was taking a customer-centric approach. And I guess... I guess what that really means is that you're thinking about what the customer is experiencing versus what you're delivering. Like you're not just thinking about here are the list of things that I'm going to say to people, but it's let me let me put myself in the customer's shoes. That's exactly right. There was some groundbreaking work that happened. Gosh, I think it was in the in the early 80s now. Jan Carlson, who was leading Scandinavian Airlines at the time, came out with his approach he called Moment of Truth. And in fact, when I was at Land's End, we we immediately glommed onto that because it was like so so magical to us because we imagined the UPS driver showing up at a customer's house. We imagined what it feels like to pull a turtleneck over your head for the first time. And what Jan helped us understand was there are moments of truth where you intersect your customer's life, and if you can inventory those moments and then create an operationally deliberate way to deliver not just that moment, but a great emotion that comes with that moment, then you will separate yourself from other people. And it's it's doing that hard work ahead of time for identifying the moments and then being really great at delivering them, which is where the work falls. I would think. Is that, do you think the greatest obstacle, or which of those do you think is the greatest obstacle to actually getting to the point that you're providing this kind of service? Is it is it wrapping your mind around the idea of it, or is it in the actual delivery of it, especially organization-wide? 
I, I would say there's three things, really. Well, three or four. Let me walk you through the first. The first is your, the wrapping the mind around it. We think about our business in terms of the competencies we've created inside of our operational, our operation, branch operation, customer data, sales, marketing, service. The customer doesn't experience our business that way. They experience it through looking for a credit union, going in for the first time, signing up an account, uh, having an overdraft, you know, whatever those things are. So the first piece of work is rethinking the business of our operation from a customer point of view. Right. The second thing is creating a collaboration across the silos who are used to doing work separately. And the third thing is having the patience to implement the changes because we are quarterly inclined as businesses. And so if it's not taking within the first 60 days, we're quick to abandon it. We're quick to walk away if we're not seeing some big ROI payoff immediately. Right. And yet this is not a small undertaking. It's not it's not as simple as handing out a script to everybody and saying, here, why don't you offer everybody a CD this month? <laughs> it's <laughs> That's really... Right. That's right. You bet. Yeah, no, we've seen a lot of crazy crazy things going on in the in the in the companies trying to be customer focused over the last you know 25 years or so everything from you know sending everybody a crystal ball with the word customer etched on it to one company i walked in and they had blue blankets wrapped over everybody's chair and i'm like what's that for they said because we pull up a chair for the customer at every meeting you know those things are silly and symbolic and don't work um so the work is really around doing, being deliberate and connecting the silos and uh, really uh, building an experience, an operating plan to deliver an experience. Do you think it's something that any organization can accomplish? Is, it, is this only for special organizations who can get it? Or can, can any credit union with enough work and dedication get here? I think, I think when you get it, you become special. And I think it's within the reach of any credit union who's willing to really rethink their business from a customer experience standpoint, have leaders who are willing to challenge the status quo, and who who give people the opportunity to, you know, bring have a seat at the table when they're redesigning the customer experience. You know, the front line sees a lot of stuff that's going on. A big part of this is culturally getting rid of the fear factor, letting people say, hey, this is a stupid rule. Why did we ever create this rule? And really um, be willing to do the hard work. Right. I think that's so true. So I was on customer customerlist.com, and I was taking your quiz on customer service just uh, to see how my hypothetical corporation would score. Um, yeah. And you had a lot of questions about um, customers giving referrals and selling on a on, a, on your company's behalf. Yep. Um, which made me think, um, I think so many of the organizations I've spoken to over the years, when you get to the point of asking them, are you are your customers referring their friends and family to you, they're kind of tearing out their hair going, I, I don't know how to get my customers to that point. Is that a separate hurdle? Or actually, as as you open this, this uh, discussion, you were saying that this may be less of a hurdle now with social media. It's actually the same hurdle it's always been. But what we know now is social media is the megaphone all customers have in their mouth, in their hand to tell other people about the experience you're delivering. I want to leave everyone with these three words, earn the right. People think that the work is to go get a customer referral. You need to earn the customer referral. And the way to earn the customer referral is to be deliberate about the touch points or the moments of truth where you intersect their life about being reliable in the most critical touch points where they need you. If, for example, you don't have a consistent process for how to open up an account, for how to get help when you need it, then your customer can't tell another customer what they get from you, how they get it, how it feels, and how they were treated. And so it's, it's around really delivering these experiences that where you'll earn recommendations, but you can't get them. There's, this whole thing where people want to create recommendation programs kind of makes me nuts because if you're delivering a great experience, your customers are going to want their grandmother to go to you They're, because it will be easier for your grandmother to, to, to save money at your credit union than anywhere else. But you need to really earn the right. And and that to me seems like it's a um, 
it's an organization wide. It is the it's the whole experience. It's the product. It's the service. It's the it's the whole ongoing thing. And so that's right. That's right. Maybe it's it's both easier and more difficult than <laughs> we'd like to think it is. I mean, well, ul- yeah. ultimately, ultimately, you should be delivering on all of these areas. It's just um, it, it takes a certain amount of effort. I think the other thing I was going to ask you is. Um, is it enough just to be doing a good job, or is there some um, imperative on the part of management to to sell to not just to your to your members, but also to your staff the idea that you are this is part of your identity to to provide excellent member experience for for everyone who works. Well, on one of the major things around becoming I use the term beloved company because it kind of embraces growth organic growth because people love you so much and are willing to put their neck on the line recommending you. A, a belo- the most important thing about a beloved company is the internal culture. What's on the inside shows up on the outside. And so the companies that are loved the most are also loved the most by their employees. And so it's less about selling and more about involving them in the journey and, and honoring them. For example, in in my new book, I Love You More Than My Dog, I guess it's not super new right now, the first decision that beloved companies make is they decide to believe. They believe their customers, but they also believe their employees. They believe in the goodness of their employees, but they do this by making sure they hire people with the same core values that they want uh, to be delivered to customers. But then they hire, they develop and train them enough so that, that once they've got those skills, They can trust their judgments. They can trust their skills. And so they get rid of a lot of the rules and regulations and policies and procedures that, you know, move our great people we hire from doing what's right to always having to ask someone for approval. And in these great companies that customers love, people people are able to do what they know is right because they've been hired the right way, they've been trained and developed, and they're given the service and support around the tools and the education uh, to do what's right when they're interacting with customers. Well, it it makes so much sense, um, and it seems like such a worthy goal. And what I'm hearing from you um, that maybe sounds as good as anything else is that it, it sounds like it makes your organization a great place to work. It really does. I mean, the reason why, you know, we loved Land's End was, for example, we were able to bring the best version of ourselves to work every day. The decisions that we made there when I was there let us have congruence of of what I call heart and habit. We were able to make business decisions that were congruent with the core values we made when we made personal decisions. It's when you push people to be in an environment to compromise their own core values, to make judgments against customers that they wouldn't make against their grandmother, that people feel like they've just been pushed into executing tasks and they can't can't use all parts of their brain. And that's where people are coming in, they're punching the clock, they're getting the paycheck, but they're not really part of the fiber of the company. Well, I think we've got a lot to talk about in May. Um, I'm I'm certainly looking forward to hearing more um, at Think 11 and – I want to thank you again for taking time to talk with us today. We certainly have, um, I think, a lot of a lot of ideas to share in. Oh, you're um, so welcome. In the future, so thank you again. We'll thank see you, you in May. Okay, thanks, Gail.